Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, this is uh, Dr. John Edwards from Mama's Chiropractic and Pathways Connect Southwest Florida. Uh, we're down here in Southwest Florida talking with Dr. Kelly Brogan. Uh, she's a holistic psychiatrist and all-around guru on women's health issues. <laughs> I've been reading Dr. Kelly's work for the last, uh, I guess, year or so and absolutely love the opportunity to talk with her one-on-one -on -one, um, and share that information with everybody else. She wrote an article in the last issue of Pathways to Family Wellness magazine uh, entitled, A New Leaf, Eight Conscious Choices for a Healthier Pregnancy. And uh, one of the interesting things that I found, at least reading through the article, is as a non-pregnant person, uh, I really found a lot of the things applicable to even me and something that I would share with the kids and the patients in our practice, too. Um, so yeah, without any further ado, welcome Dr. Kelly. Thanks for joining us today. Total pleasure, total pleasure. Well, I, I just wanted to just kind of you know, take your pulse on a couple things today. Um, first off, I, as, a, as a psychiatrist, uh, I don't know if it surprised you or not to find how well the chiropractic profession has just opened up their arms to, to what, you, what you think and write about and feel. Um, has any of that come as a surprise to you with, with how well you've been embraced in alternative health care? I don't think so. It's funny. I often I often reflect on how the the message that I try to disseminate really isn't that original. I mean, uh, much of what I much of what I have to say, naturopaths and chiropractors, and acupuncturists have been, you know, sort of. Who is it? Who's here? I don't know. Somebody's trying to ring in. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a three way here. Huh. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Consider it ambient, ambient music. That was weird. Is that your phone ring? No. Well, that's it's the same ringtone as my yes. phone. And it's then my phone rang. And so, I don't know. I have a Google phone. Maybe it's trying to do something weird like that. We're just going to have to shut it off. Okay. Um, anyway. Anyway. Um, no, I was just saying that, you know, I, for the most part, a lot of a lot of what I espouse is not new to the holistic health community, and, and it's only really novel because it's coming from somebody with my background. Uh, it has been my perspective, you know, that it, it carries a special meaning for me to consider things like nutrition and gut health as, uh, you know, sort of paramount in in the health paradigm. Uh, but it's really, you know, these concepts have been you know, uh, foundational for centuries for, for many non-Western forms of, of medicine. So, um, you know, it's, what's interesting to me is that I find a lot of alternative and, and holistic health practitioners and, and even, you know, a lot of the chiropractors that I work with sort of have this feeling like psychiatry and severe mental illness is something that they sort of can't touch, you know, that they can help their patients in all these other ways, but if they if they need to be on, quote unquote, need to be on medications or if, if they need to be in the care of a psychiatrist, then well, that's how it should be and how it needs to be. Uh, and so I guess what I'd like to sort of shake up a little bit is to have all of us take a look at how we are together collaborating um, to protect you know the 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 state of mental health treatment in America and permit it even you know in our patients that we sort of have the sense that they might be better off um, with a, engaging another model. But I think there's a lot of fear around challenging the paradigm of psychiatry, and so hopefully I can you know help shepherd those who are interested in in questioning it. Yeah, what was your exposure to this? Uh, I, I was just reading a blog you posted earlier in the month about uh, folate and, and the impact of that on the brain. Um, and I saw that you have, um, you said something I thought was really interesting, that it's it's odd for you anymore to, to look at, at brain and, and, and mental state isolated from things like the gut and from the immune system. And I thought that was a, a really interesting perspective. What, what was you, the jumping off point for you when when you're sitting there in your residency, you said, "Wait, there's got to be something else here." Uh, how'd you How'd you come into this? I have a fairly boring, undramatic story, which is that <laughs> I, yeah, I wish it was a little more spicy. But uh, I developed uh, postpartum thyroiditis or Hashimoto's after my first pregnancy, and was really sort of just, you know, sort of dipping my toe in the realm of alternative medicine at that point. Um, 
but I knew that I didn't want to take Synthroid for the rest of my life, so I had the good sense to see a naturopath who essentially introduced me to the, the sort of premise of multi-system health, right? So the interconnectedness of all different realms of the body and the power of, of diet. So it was through resolving that condition in myself that I, I was convinced firsthand you know, that there's a power to this. But then, I, you know, it was the sort of the training in functional medicine that I've had which employs this an analogy or sort of, I guess, a parable in a way of, you know, a bunch of blind men in a room feeling an elephant, right? And, and so one's feeling the leg, one's feeling the trunk, and, and they're each describing totally different, you know, sort of entities that aren't reflective of the whole, right? So nobody's seeing the whole elephant. And I, I always thought that was really resonant because there's, you know, in Manhattan, which is where I practice, there's such a, you know, this thriving um, sub, sub, sub niche specialist practice model where you know everybody has their hyper 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 specialty and there are very few people who are trained clinicians who are trained to really look at the patient as as a whole and so I, I see many many complex patients who have you know been been through the ringer trying to get answers but it's because they've been seeing all of these you know specialists looking through very disparate lenses that nobody's really been able to put it together so you know, I think that I, in many ways, don't really believe in psychiatry. I don't really believe in mental health as distinct from uh, the rest of human physiology. And I, I think we'd be hard pressed to really make the argument for any subspecialty uh, having, you know, sort of necessitating a u very unique approach. I mean, I do exactly what my, you know, gastro. Uh, enterology functional medicine colleague does exactly what you know my neurology colleague does from the same perspective it's just that I happen to see patients who are most bothered by complaints like anxiety or depression or you know insomnia or even you know hypomania or mania or psychosis so yeah yeah the uh, the, the Descartes error the separation between yes. the body being a um, probably very important mistake and misstep that we've made absolutely yeah trying to bring everything back together and helping people understand the importance of how it all interplays. That's cool. It's a, you know, not as boring of a story as you think it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just throw a little more drama in there. In the yeah, no, no. It's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great one. Anytime someone gets a, uh, a return to their health, you know, goes on that journey, yeah. I always like hearing those stories. It's kind of my, my passion collecting those. So that's, that's a cool one. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about your article, if you, if you got some time. The, uh, I really enjoyed, like I said, you hit on so many things that I was going, I almost checked in my spare bedroom to see if you had a camera at like six <laughs> in there. I, I do a lot of these things, and it almost made me want to come in earlier and double check my, my water cooler to yep. three, <laughs> six, seven, are any of these on there? Um, because I think not only did you bring up some excellent points, you also got really specific with easy recommendations, mm -hmm. which, you know, making it usable, that's that's the thing, right? Um, and, and so a couple of the things that I just wanted to ask you if you wanted to expound a little bit more on, um, you were talking about things like um, uh, cho choosing to minimize magnetic fields. You know, we, we were talking, uh, it's, it's something that isn't tangible necessarily, yeah. but uh, at, you, you wrote in there that there's there's ways that, that you've seen that impact your patients. Um, it's not something that gets talked about a whole lot, and I think you have a good opportunity now to kind of explain a little bit about that. We, we're conscious of that in our practice. We have our little diffusers on all of our iPads and our computers and all that, so um, yeah, I'd just like to hear your take on that. Absolutely. So there, there's sort of two ways to categorize a lot of these decisions, I guess. Um, some are consumerist choices that you'd be making anyway that you could potentially improve upon, right? So if you're going to go to, you know, the, the drugstore or supermarket and buy a laundry detergent, you could choose one here or you could choose one here. And, it, and potentially, you know, the one on your left might uh, pose less risk to you and your family than the one on your right. So that's just a matter of basic education. But when it comes to being proactive, uh, so consuming to protect yourself, um, I think of, you know, sort of EMF mitigation in that category, right? Because most of us, uh, you know, when we are sort of participating uh, in, in the technological world, we feel like it's almost non-optional. I mean, certainly as a fairly health-minded person, I spend the vast majority of my life 
relating to technology, and it's you know feels almost non-optional, which of course it is uh, in, in essence. But not, um, not if you want to be electronic health record compliant. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so you know, so then we think about okay, so what are ways we could possibly behaviorally mitigate some of these uh, risks, or maybe you know we could engage in consumerism to actually protect ourselves. So the diffusers that you mentioned, things like Stetzer um, units, are you know you can actually measure. You know you can you can measure the rate of mitigation when you use a unit like that or when you don't, and it of course depends on the environment in your house. Um, then there are other things that are more behavioral, like turning off your router, your Wi-Fi at night, um, keeping your cell phone more than six feet away from your bed. And you know, I, I use um, and have patients who have had benefit from uh, earthing sheets. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I think of this as being you know, sort of a difficult arena to engage in terms of an evidence base. Um, but I do think that there is compelling science behind, uh, you know, what might be going on in terms of our bodies being conductive, you know, conductive in the way that they are and, and how poorly adapted we must be genomically to tolerate the assault that we're living in on a daily basis. I'm glad, I'm glad that's a great segue into the next part that I, I really like talking to people about, which is the epigenetic aspect. Um, I was lucky enough when I went to Palmer College of Chiropractic to have Bruce Lipton come in once a year and down into Palmer to talk to us as students. And so I got introduced to, to epigenetics really early on uh, in my training. And um, it was one of those things like it, my wife grew up in Chicago and didn't realize that not everybody had a Michael Jordan. And I didn't realize that not everybody knew about epigenetics <laughs> when, I, when I came out in practice. And um, I, I think those, his work and also James Oshman, who wrote a book called Energy Medicine, The Scientific Basis, he, he talked about how the, uh, the, the cells have an ability to switch on and switch off based off of frequencies that they sit in. And on one aspect, it was like a no duh thing. I'm sitting there putting stim pads and ultrasounds on people. But on another aspect, that can be kind of um, you know, esoteric for, for the general population. You know, your general mom and dad are sitting there going, how does my cell phone impact my kid's brain, right? right. Um, other right. than just keeping them occupied. We don't necessarily realize that what just happened in this call where my phone was going off and my speakers picked it up, that that happens literally every time your phone rings, every yes. time you put your computer. Yeah. So it was a really interesting demonstration for how that came together. Um, I'd like you to, you mentioned genes, and um, some people really are, are just getting the understanding now that we aren't necessarily just our DNA. I'd love to hear your take on, on epigenetics and, and how this impacts pregnancy. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, an area I feel very passionately about because I think, you know, we're sort of in this space of cognitive dissonance, right, where we've been told about the Mendelian model. We've been told that, you know, genes are these like neatly segregated little units of information and you get some from your mom and some from your dad and that's it for life. Um, but at the same time, we've been lulled into this almost, you know, sort of coma, intellectual coma about the potential relevance of all of these now totally ubiquitous exposures, right? So when you couple those two factors together, you can understand how the average person thinks, well, I am what I am already, and everybody has all these exposures, so why should I care about it? How could this possibly be relevant? And so in now, you know, what we're calling uh, the post-genomic era or sort of more Lamarck-oriented um, understanding of how we have this opportunity in utero and even potentially throughout life to influence gene expression, what comes with that is both both this incredible sense of empowerment to sort of, you know, stomp out what your genes might have offered you that you weren't interested in, uh, but also the, the burden of agency, right? So sort of the burden of knowledge and having to sort of do something about it and make choices that are more consistent with optimal gene expression. So, you know, the, the relevance to, to pregnancy is, is potentially the most salient because we are doing really nothing as a society uh, to protect 
the unborn, you know, to protect women, their pregnancies, the fetus. Um, we're not making it easy for women by supporting legislation that actually, uh, you know, helps to diminish chemical exposures by limiting subsidization of uh, processed food and, and genetically modified crops and pesticides. You know, we're, we're making it pretty difficult, I think, as a society for the average woman to navigate a pregnancy. And so it can feel so overwhelming, I think, for, for a pregnant woman to consider all of the many different things that could be having negative effects. Um, so that's why I like to sort of spin it a little bit as an opportunity to really empower yourself with knowledge, with choices that actually, you know, can, can resonate not only um, for the, the pregnancy and birth, but actually for that child's future health as an adult, and even for their children. So it's this, what we're learning about transgenerational inheritance of epigenetic imprints. So that means that what you do in your pregnancy and the exposures that you encounter in your pregnancy can impact the health several generations forward. And uh, I mean, no pressure, right? <laughs> it, becomes, it becomes like an incredible um, charge, you know, that, that every woman has to choose to accept or not. And so I feel like the more user-friendly we can make it, uh, the more empowering it should feel, right? Because it's just these small little choices. And sometimes it's, you know, you do a, 20 minutes of research on something, you know, you buy an air filter and then it's there. And then you don't have to worry about it. You've already made the choice, you've made the decision, and you're, you're contributing to potentially, again, mitigating. Because there is this, you know, I don't want to dwell on this, but there is this sort of dark underbelly of truth to all of it, which is that, uh, you know, we're pretty deep in at this point. You know, we have now evidence uh, emerging in the literature that there is, you know, Roundup, uh, you know, glyphosate, um, Monsanto's um, best-selling herbicide in our soil, in our water, and in our breast milk. Uh, we know that Bt toxin, um, you know, that is genetically modified. Um, that is uh, in genetically modified corn is is transferring to fetal circulation, and the eighty thousand plus uh, chemicals that are you know almost entirely unstudied uh, for safety. We now know you know based on a couple of case series that more than two hundred of them are present in the average cord blood. So you know that's where this notion of being born pre-polluted comes from. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the persistence of some of these, you know, that dioxin from Vietnam, you know, decades ago is still present in, in the breast milk of, of Vietnamese women, you know, that's very disturbing and, and certainly should compel us, I think, as a society to rethink how we are studying the safety of these agents so that we're not learning too little too late about, you know, how to implement regulation. But unfortunately, I think the truth is that there's a large disincentive uh, for most, you know, for the sort of chemical industry, but also the, the, the government's relationship to it, uh, to really regulate these agents in any meaningful way in the near future, right? So what about if you're pregnant now, or you're planning on becoming pregnant in the next, you know, year or so, let's say, what can you do to, to at least mitigate? And if nothing else, for the placebo effect of feeling like you are actually doing something positive and affirming for the, for the health of your pregnancy. So, you know, we're, we're, it's an ex exploding area of literature, and, and I follow it closely. Uh, and everything that I seem to be learning is that, you know, our genes are expecting to see information of a certain type, right? Whether it's nutritional, whether it's the nature of stress, whether it's the nature of movement. Um, and of course, you know, they're not expecting to see any of the chemical compounds that have come into circulation since the Industrial Revolution. So, so how do we just sort of try to create an environment in utero that better approximates, you know, what over two plus million years our genes have come to expect? And that's sort of the overarching view of it. And there, again, it comes down to these sort of day-to-day -day decisions. Sure. The, uh, you mentioned a couple of important points in there. One is that um, if, if we're looking at helping as many of these expecting moms as we can, um, 
we're starting to get into almost a generational gap of information where you have, you know, when I give talks uh, in yeah. our community, most of the moms that I see are probably in their you know, late 20s to early 30s, and that represents a really small segment of the potential people that are um, you know, actually listening uh, to, to this message, right? That you have probably college age, right? I think about when I was at, at Truman, you know, eating off a meal plan, you know, right. drinking after class, you know, all of that. What kind of internal environment I'm creating then, well, you know, that's the same age that, that most of these babies are born to moms in their early 20s. And then what I've found is that it's usually the second pregnancy where you look back yeah. and you look and go, maybe I can do some things a little bit differently. And so crafting this message for both those sets, you know, making it something that is accessible, um, easy to understand, might be, um, like you said, almost an institutional kind of thing. Like, how do we reach out to the university programs? How do we reach out to, you know, your legislatures to help make protections for people? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really big undertaking. I'm glad we have people like you out there, you know, talking and educating about it. Well, what's, what's interesting, too, is that, uh, you know, the, the sort of signal of danger is becoming too loud to ignore. Uh, to the extent that in the past year, both the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology here and also the Royal College came out with formal bulletins uh, advising women about modifiable risk exposures. They weren't thorough in nature and they were somewhat, um, I think, falsely pacifying about the, um, you know, sort of potential risks of pesticides specifically. But they they were making recommendations about dry cleaning and personal care products, and you know of course you know uh, fish con mercury and fish consumption. Um, and in the UK, it was really poorly received. It was considered to be this inflammatory, sensational set of recommendations that were not based on firm evidence, and of course of which there was no about which there was no true consensus in terms of uh, recommendations. You know, so what w should women be doing? We're just scaring them, right? And we're, we're not helping them in any way. Um, but the fact is that, you know, it's it's too prominent a concern really things like BPA for example plasticizers uh, you know the literature is so robust that at this point despite the fact that the FDA tried to reassure us several years ago that there's no concern at this point we can't deny it anymore so for an obstetrician for example um, to not have this discussion which of course 70 to 80 percent of them are not having this discussion with their patients is really hopefully soon to be considered irresponsible uh, so I do think there's a um, I have to believe <laughs> that there is a you know sort of a tide um, bringing, bringing some sort of change but hopefully so what yeah. the, what do you think the best way to, to address that is I, I always say that probably the most important person in health policy in the United States in the last 10, 20 years doesn't have a medical degree. Uh, in fact, she only just has a journalism degree, the Oprah Winfrey. Anytime yeah. she would talk about something, man, you'd see some radical change. Uh, yeah. Do you think the approach should be that we talk to the healthcare providers, to the lay public? You know, where, where, where do you focus your energy with your blog and, and with what you write and talk about in your practice? Yeah, so I only came on the social media scene uh, less than a year ago, and, and I did that because I started to feel compelled. Did I lose you? No, no, I'm sorry. Okay, cool. Because I started to feel uh, compelled by this sort of activism and in a sense of uh, a broader mission. And of course, I sit with patients one on one. I talk to my girlfriends and family about my concerns, uh, but that's such a limited reach around an issue that is really. Uh, of, of such importance that I feel it should be familiar at least to to every woman uh, and family frankly out there so I I decided to go the consumer empowerment route and patient empowerment route and try to to get my message I guess into the home of every soccer mom in America type of a, a, a sort of ambition um, I do think that we ha we can look at the fact that things like gluten-free, you know, 
who had heard of gluten free ten years ago, and now it's a you know a multi billion dollar industry, not because there's a single piece of legislation to support that, but because of consumer demand. So you know that's that's the silver lining of our capitalist system here uh, is that in fact we can self correct. Uh, you know, hopefully it's it's within a time frame where we haven't done too much damage to to future generations. But I do believe that every person, you know, in the voting with your dollar concept, and that every person can make these micro decisions every day and um, and and contribute to a more radical change. Sure, that's it's what they, they they call that tipping point where we can at exactly. least build up enough information so people can get the idea that. Um, I mean, Jimmy Kimmel did a bit not too long ago about what is a gluten, and uh, yes, yes. he interviewed people from all over in these gyms, <laughs> and uh, they said, "Oh yeah, I'm gluten free. I'm gluten free." And they asked, "What's a gluten?" Right? Who knows? I, mean, yeah. you know, I, really I shouldn't be eating. Probably that's all. <laughs> right. No. So it's it's interesting that, that once you hit a point where you can gain momentum, like you said with EPA. It ceases to become relevant whether or not you have powers of be to say, oh, no, no, it's safe. Because, like you said, there's a little bit of an underbelly to things when you look at, okay, who is the head of this agency? Oh, they used to work for this company. Right. And then you see the interconnection and that interplay there, and you go, well, maybe the best bet is just talking to people and sharing things on Facebook and sharing things. And it's, it's almost like you know, a lot of us were trained in the era where you know, the Internet isn't a valid resource. But now you have medical journals that publish solely online. And so we're starting to see a little bit of a swing there where people say, OK, well, now I understand where the source is coming from. And you're getting, you know, it's getting to be, I, I have a patient that, and a friend that, that said there's, in, in today's day and age, there's no excuse for not Googling something. <laughs> and uh, even though Google will kind of steer your search results, at least the more you, you write, like you do, uh, about topics and help bring that up for people. Um, at least it gives you the opportunity to get in front of them and say, hey, you may want to think about this a little differently. There's been a lot of people for a long time that have been questioning this. And um, here's some of the reasons why, which is one of the, the things I really love about your writing. Um, I think you explained that well. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the truth is that we can't, as much as I, you know, I do watch my educated uh, patients defer to, to clinicians they've seen maybe before me uh, as, as authority figures on matters of health. <laughs> um, you know, for the most part, the average American citizen recognizes that there are limitations to the type of information that um, a doctor can offer them, right? And they know, you know, the, the 58 percent of, uh, you know, patients who are taking um, uh, natural supplements along with a prescription, let's say, there's there's some sense that they can take things into their own hands. They can educate themselves in a way that their clinician probably isn't even well equi equipped to do. And part of the problem when it comes to uh, toxic exposures is that the actual bench research, so the science itself, uh, has to be completely reinvented because it's based on this dose makes the poison premise. Right? It's based on a now antiquated notion that in no way takes into account epigenetics and, and things, concepts like xenohormesis, right? where there's potentially even you know, very small doses have different effects than medium or big doses. Um, and what about the synergy? Right? So we're all living in this veritable sort of soup of, of chemicals, right? and they interact in a powerful way. Uh, you know, we, we know that, for example, because we know that the active ingredient in Roundup, which is glyphosate, uh, is about 10,000 times less toxic than the combination of adjuvants and other chemicals that make up Roundup itself, right? So there's something in the collaboration of multiple chemical exposures that bench research studying just BPA, you know, or just dioxin, or, you know, just a single agent at a time they're just not accounting for that. So when, you, when you've been reassured about the safety of a totally novel chemical, odds are it's based on this antiquated model of research. So that's why to be one step ahead, you sort of only need to use common sense. That, you know, 
that consuming all of your food out of plastic, uh, for example, um, or, or drinking municipal water, um, or, or living in, in New York City and not filtering your air would be in any way compatible with uh, best health outcomes. So in many ways, you don't have to wait for the science. You can just sort of, again, think of this more ancestral model of, so, okay, what is my body expecting here? You know, am I delivering anything approximating that? Yeah, it's just, just encouraging people. Again, the title of the article was about conscious choices. And I think sometimes if people just stop and think and go, well, what did my grandparents do? Exactly. Uh, you know, that's, or maybe great, but let's say like great great grandparents. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. They get a couple generations back. Yeah, I, I forget I'm getting older than I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a it's a great point that, that people don't necessarily need to know all the uh, the nitty gritty details of things um, if they can kind of stop and, and reflect back and, and think, okay, just because I've always done this and just because my friends do this too, is this going to be the right choice for me? I mean, they might feel kind of like weirdos, but um, you know there are communities out there that are growing uh, to help with that. And um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that we're glad to have you with, uh, with the uh, Freedom for Family Wellness Summit. Uh, it's it's going to be in, in November. We'll definitely be seeing you there. I'm presenting, as, as, and I know that you're presenting too. Yes, I'm um, so excited. Yeah, it's going to be great. We have these opportunities to, to gather and to talk. We're trying to do local things here. Um, and I've got to, I, I keep on looking up to see if we have questions online. I don't, I don't see any there, but um, I've got kind of a question and answer uh, portion now. Do you guys have anything that you wanted to ask Kelly specifically? No? I need time um, to think about it. I'm just wondering, as a, you know, as a psychiatrist, do you feel like with all the prevalence rates, in neurological and psychiatric conditions, do you feel like they're truly increasing in this generation? And if so, do you feel like these factors that we've been discussing are related to that increase in prevalence in this generation? That's a that's a great question because I think the answer is is yes and no, right? Because uh, I think you know so so now the statistic is like 11 percent of Americans are um, taking psychotropic medication right it's one in four women of reproductive age uh, are potentially going into a pregnancy taking psychotropics um, and I just wrote a little ditty on the fact that now 10,000 toddlers so under three are medicated with stimulants for ADHD right so of course I it should not surprise anyone listening, you know, to, to learn that my perspective is that psychiatry is taking advantage of an opportunity uh, to label with a, a diagnosis a phenomenon that, of course, is not genetic, right, and that is not actually uh, really psychiatric in nature, right? So in psychiatry, there are no objective tests, you know, if you sit for 15 minutes with a psychiatrist, you could leave with a diagnosis, a prescription that you may take for a lifetime. Uh, and so there's no way to really refute or challenge that diagnosis because it was just one clinician's subjective opinion. So there's, of course, a danger, very slippery slope, uh, you know, wherein this umbrella of psychiatry can, can cast shade on almost the entire population probably at some point. Uh, but what they are, what, what psychiatry is sort of like ushering into that, under that umbrella, is uh, reflective of the neurodevelopmental impact and effects of these exposures. That's certainly my belief. So whether it's um, exposures to um, dietary antigens and, and toxicity, uh, preservatives, and you know, even stimulant, <laughs> stimulants like MSG, you know, in utero, whether it's um, vaccine exposures whether it's birthing mode, ultrasound, um, you know, lack of breastfeeding, what, what do we know about uh, the role of the microbiome of gut bacteria and the transfer from mom to baby and how is that impacting behavior because we certainly have been uh, excited by the prospect that in rodents we can change behavior through, um, through fecal transplants, for example, so we know that the microbiota plays a role. So these are all of the different elements that are contributing to a lot of really, really sick kids, and you know, to, to say that 
uh, these kids have always been around and they just weren't diagnosed and they need correction of their brain chemicals through, um, you know, through, through a scheduled prescription drug, you know, it is really, um, it really saddens me, you know, to think about it. It's almost over, too overwhelming. I sometimes am grateful that I don't, you know, treat children to have to be exposed to all of the aftermath of these, you know, sort of poor decisions. And, and I really just think that so many moms, if they only knew, if they only knew at the right time um, the potential risks of some of these exposures, they of course would have made a different choice. But if everyone around them is telling them, oh, it's fine, we're all fine, we all use Johnson and Johnson shampoo and we're fine, you know, there's, there's this sort of, um, again, like a pacifying effect that I think is so dangerous. But the burden shouldn't be on, you know, women having babies at home, for example, to, to prove that this is a safe choice. Of course, the burden should be on the intervention. The burden should be on a change from what, what has been going on for two million years. It shouldn't be on, um, you know, those choosing to, to bring things back to sort of a more natural order. That is so, a yeah, I mean, the, the answer is, yeah. A lot of times uh, you'll, you'll find um, you know, people question, oh, you know, why, why are you going back to doing things like water burping at home instead of, you know, and, and asking for the evidence of that safety when, like you said, we've had this capability for millions of years to do this and, and not looking at more research and evidence on the safety and long-term implications of these relatively newer interventions. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's a lot of misplaced fear, right? So it's, it's, it's fear-mongering induced by industry and medical industrial complex for sure. But it's, it's misplaced, right? Because then, then women are sort of, you know, their compass is I've written about this. They're sort of compass co-opted and, and they feel like to have a healthy birth and a healthy child, they need to protect against all of these horrible things that can happen. These, you know, they, babies can die in birth and, and they can die of infectious disease early on. And, and if I don't do these things, if I don't engage these interventions, then I'm being reckless, right? So instead of having grave concerns about the in interventions themselves, they have concerns about the lack of intervention. So it's to my mind, really a, a misplaced fear. And, and of course, those interventions are designed, really, for women who don't otherwise prize their health, their immunity, uh, their well-being, their stress management, you know, all of these other things, you know, which obviate the need for any of these interventions, of course. It's a different way of looking at it. Do you have anything else? Yeah, uh, well, I, I just wanted to, again, thank you very, very much for your time today. Um, I, I could probably sit here and talk to you all day, quite literally, but <laughs> you have to be your time. Um, it's been an absolute joy to, uh, again, I didn't know that you've only been, you know, getting out here in the social media for the last year, so um, I feel pretty lucky that uh, Pathways has found you and, and helped expose um, a lot of people to your work. Uh, because uh, it's the same way that I got introduced to Pathways. Is I, I wanted to do this since I was 15. I used to tear out a lot of drug ads and a lot of articles out of Newsweeks and hand patients three-page deep uh, <laughs> magazines yeah. to read reception areas. And then I found this and agreed with everything that I read. And it taught me something, too. And all of the authors that I've seen in there have really um, broadened my horizons on a lot of different um, aspects of health and I, that I then was able to share with my patients. So, um, Absolutely. I mean, there's something really why I love, you know, Pathways and, and uh, everything connected to it is because there are so few um, clinicians who can really sort of take in the whole of it, right? So, so Pathways is about radical holistic health, right? It's not yeah. about picking and choosing. It's not about saying, well, there's a lot that modern medicine is doing for us. We don't want to dismiss that. Um, it's about saying, hold on a minute. We are doing something, you know, sort of highly questionable and potentially, you know, gravely dangerous for, you know, the health of our families and our, and our children. Let's, let's think about how we can look at this in a, in a more sort of like through a broader lens. And, and so it, 
it encompasses like the subject matter, right? Encompasses everything um, from from diet to to birthing to inter medical interventions to vaccination to pharmaceuticals, and it's really looking at the whole picture. Whereas a lot of clinicians really have one core advocacy, and it's sort of all they can tolerate, right? Like there's not a lot of overlap I've found between people who have concerns about the vaccine program and also about genetically. Uh, modified foods, right? You would think that those two camps would have a lot in common in terms of ideologic interests, but they really don't. Uh, and so it's sometimes, I think, hard and, and overwhelming to take it all in at once, but that's the beauty of a community like this and of connecting to like minds is, is that there are people who, who really feel, you know, impassioned about this, this sort of way of thinking about life and wellness and that it all makes sense seamlessly so you don't have to just choose one issue to get all hot and bothered about you know so it's really yeah. about just getting excited about a different way of doing it yeah when you start from a foundation of vitalism that that, the, that we're intelligent inside we, we, we know what we're doing we absolutely every night and still our hearts beat and our lungs breathe and digest dinner you don't have to think about it absolutely human beings inside us in the same four weeks you know we you don't have to do an instruction manual or anything. I think when you start from that place and you see that the way that health gets interfered with is either, you know, physically you can get interfered with, mentally and emotionally you can get interfered with, and uh, obviously chemically you can get interfered with, it makes sense to, to be broad and open to a lot of these ideas, um, to, to see and, and hear about um, just, you know, the, the conscious parenting aspect of, of understanding that maybe the way things have always been done in your life isn't it isn't necessarily the best way to do things. It's okay that you have done them that way. But right. There's other options. So yeah, it's it's a it's it's been great. Um, I, I love having people like you, people like Sayer, uh, people like Bruce Lipton in my life, Greg Braden, um, you know, Ina May Gaskin to, to you know the, the, you know everywhere from your pioneers who have been doing this for 50 years um, to to the people who are now starting to bubble up in the consciousness. Uh, and, and all these people around us in our communities. It's, it's, it's a really, really great use for the social media to, to make our community interconnected this way. Um, yes, well, I couldn't agree more. It's really the whole point yeah. <laughs> to, to well, my mind. Thank you very much for your time with us today. Um, this is going to be a great one for YouTube because we didn't get cut out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we made it all the way to the end. Uh, we're going to go ahead and stop the broadcast, um, but I invite you, if you, if you want to hang out for a little bit of time, uh, we always like to talk about, um, share some personal stories and personal time uh, off camera. Um, if you have time for that, you're welcome to. Uh, but Absolutely. I want to thank you for tuned in. Uh, please feel free to share this with your family and friends if you're watching it right now. Uh, we've got a lot of good information in this talk that really needs to get out there, so uh, thanks, for, thanks for watching. We're going to go ahead and switch off and, yeah. Do you have anything else? No? Okay.